this or something like it, they think was the murder weapon. They convict him of murder. The amount of blood and the secrets that came out about him. I would have wanted to see more. Hello and welcome to Best Case, Worst Case. I'm your host, Francie Hakes, former state and federal prosecutor. This is a special edition of Best Case, Worst Case we like to call Worst Case Scenario. And joining me in the studio today is... Jim Clementi, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor and writer-producer of CBS's Criminal Minds. Bobby Chacon, retired FBI special agent. And I'm Maureen O'Connell, retired FBI special agent. Well, let's pick right back up where we stopped last time, you guys. We were talking about uh, Michael Peterson, the case against him, the bloody stairwell, uh, the blood spatter Maureen was talking about, and the death of Elizabeth Ratliff. Uh, in addition to the affairs he was having in his marriage... All of this evidence came to the jury. The judge allowed all of that in. And so the jury got to evaluate it all. But there was really pretty key evidence in the case that many of the jurors cited later as having particular significance. And that was the evidence by the uh, local agent, Deaver, who was kind of the blood spatter analyst who did the recreations and described exactly how he thought the crime happened and how the blood ended up where it did. Right. And he also built a scale model of the hallway and the stairway. And he gave some really, I would call, damning testimony during the first trial. He did. And he was someone that we didn't really see it in the film, but there were hearings ahead of time, ahead of the trial, where the judge had to listen to his qualifications and pre-qualify him as an expert, where he made a lot of representations about how many falls scenes that he had responded to, how much blood spatter analysis that he had done, and overall how many scenes with blood that he had been involved in assessing how that blood got where it was. Right. So what was interesting in the show about Deaver was he was very certain, very dismissive of the defense claims, which were based in part, Jim, as we talked last time, about defense experts, although they didn't testify, Henry Lee and Werner Spitz. Yeah, they did evaluate the case. I don't think that either of them testified, and that might have been because both of them have extremely heavy accents. Um, and this is not a case that was tried in the middle of New York City, where people are used to varying degrees of accents from all over the world. Uh, and it was in the South. And that probably turned off a lot of prospective jurors. So the defense team decided not to use them. Well, and they did do mock juries ahead of the trial, in fact. And some of those mock jurors did cite the accent, specifically of Dr. Lee, and saying, I couldn't understand what he was saying. So the defense might have been afraid they discounted. Bobby, what do you Yeah, think? I mean, I always respected Dr. Lee's work. And I know Jim's worked closely with him on a number of cases. And, you know, when I saw this show and I saw his presentation or his theory, I really, I actually, I think, texted him during the during the show and I was like I couldn't believe he was positing the theory that the seven lacerations on the back of her head was this this continually getting up slipping getting up slipping getting up slipping falling back and hitting herself continually on that head I thought it was kind of an outrageous theory and in addition to maybe his accent being heavy I think the defense might have gone this particular theory may just not play well with the jury yeah but I think the prosecution's theory was just as ridiculous in fact more so because the physical evidence and the weapon that they decided to bring into court and and make this big hullabaloo about I don't think could have anywhere near produced that kind of injury on that person. And it certainly wouldn't have survived that incident. I agree. And I think that I think Deaver's um, testimony and his presentations, I I didn't like them at all. I wasn't impressed with them. I I didn't think his demeanor on the stand was very good. As a juror, I probably would have been turned off to that guy a little bit, even though he's testifying for the government. Um, I I just didn't think I thought some of those um, recreations and those experiments that he did were pretty cheesy and not based in science. And and so I really wasn't impressed at all with Deaver's presentation. Well, and Maureen, I really would like to get your take on this whole blowpoke issue, because the prosecution said very clearly this or something like it they think was the murder weapon, or at least the weapon used to injure the back of her head repeatedly. You've done a lot of crime scenes. You've taken a lot of photos, presumably of dead bodies. What did you think of that theory? I thought they should have stuck more closely to an object, something like this. It should have been an unknown object. She was struck with an unknown object and that object could have been the stair. I mean, it could have gone back to what Jim said about her being thrown onto the staircase. It could have been a pole that disappeared like his clothes disappeared um, from the actual event. So so Maureen, you, you obviously think that the prosecution should have stuck to it was something like that. And that's one of the biggest weaknesses of prosecutors. And I admit to it myself. You don't want an unanswered question. An unanswered question haunts you because you know know that the defense is going to take that, list it on their board as a reasonable doubt, and try to drive a truck through the space where the unknown object exists. And so I understand their desire to find the murder weapon, but they definitely should have been more careful. Actually, I think it was not the desire to find the murder weapon in this case that prompted the prosecution to put forth that theory. I think that the fact that his blowpoke was missing from that house is what they keyed in on. They said it must have been this because she gave, one of his relatives gave them to all the other relatives, and he's is his is the only one that's missing. Mm-hmm. So the fact that they didn't find it is, I think, what drove them even more to say this must be the murder weapon. When I think the prosecution would have been better served by just saying, obviously, it was just some blunt object. That right. Any number of blunt objects you can find around someone's house could have done this. But because they keyed in on that poker and they said, this blow poke is the murder weapon and that's why it's missing from his house. I think that that was a misstep. But when you see them holding it and you yeah. hear it, when he puts it down, you it's can very it's light. hollow. It's it's light. Light. Brass is a very soft metal. Yes. You know, brass is and soft metal. Literally, if you try to swing it on your forearm, it would bend over the forearm. It would literally bend. And if you yeah. hit it twice, it might break in half. Right. It's really that weak. It's, it's, only made, ones, it's only made to get your breath into the fire. Deliver oxygen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and that was, and that theory blew up 
up in the prosecution's face the night before closing arguments when the defense found the blow poke at Peterson's house in what clearly looked like a spot it had been for months and months because it was covered in cobwebs. Yeah. That was well, fishy. It was a little fishy. It was a little fishy. But it might be fishy, but that is why as a prosecutor, you simply cannot establish, you can't hang your hat on something you just don't oh, no. have. Right. You have got to a- admit you don't know. Right. You don't know something. And that's really hard for prosecutors. Yeah. Well, despite all of that, it goes to the jury. And what does the jury do? They convict him. They convict him of murder and he goes to jail. And despite the fact that there are questions and there are maybe some really ridiculous theories that the prosecution put forth, the jury felt like, well, this guy killed his wife and he went to jail. Well, and that's one of the things that I think is the best thing about this documentary series is that it showed very thoroughly the strength and intelligence of Peterson's defense team. They pulled out every stop. They did not, they didn't fail to look at anything or any theory in order to try to see that he is was acquitted in the case. So you cannot blame his defense attorneys for the guilty verdict. They did their best. They did everything they could. I think it came down to three things. One, the body was never moved or hugged. The amount of blood and the secrets that came out about him. Yeah, I think going back to the, the amount of blood and the condition of the blood when the EMTs got there. Yes. If she had just fallen, if she was literally still breathing when Peterson found her and called 911, there wouldn't have been that degree of dried blood all over the crime scene. And they were very, very adamant about that. And these are people that see blood all the time, every day. That's what they deal in. So I'm really putting a lot more weight on that than on his description of what was going on during that 911 call. And the fact that he would lie about her breathing tells me he needed to account for a lapse in time. And that would only be done by somebody who was complicit in her death. Which is exactly what I was talking about when I talked about him having to clean up afterwards. We have to explain what that gap in time is. And that goes along with our theory. Unless he is a stone cold psychopath, because psychopaths will recover very quickly after a traumatic event. They get very excited, very energetic. They're thrill seekers, most of them, but they will recover very quickly. And they can do rational thinking in, in an instant after something like this, whereas normal people would really take a long time to calm down and collect their thoughts and make a plan. And so they might call 911 at like, I don't know, six o'clock the next morning or something like that and, you know, pretend to be all excited. Well, and the interesting thing about this to me also is from a jury standpoint, you know, as a prosecutor, you always want to bring them perfect evidence. You want to explain every little thing. And the state tried in this case and the defense brought in computer animation. You guys remember seeing that they had computer animation of what they think happened inside the stairwell. Mm -hmm. So they also brought in their experts. And to me, what the jury's guilty verdict really shows, given the weakness in the state's uh, experts, I think is that juries kind of tend to disregard. If you've got a battle of the experts, they go with common sense. And it was the biggest argument I made to juries. Don't, you don't have to leave your common sense at the door to this courtroom when you walk in. Use your common sense and your deliberations. That's a and, good I, point. and I think for all of us, you look at all that blood and those injuries on her body, and it just doesn't make sense that she fell down the stairs. And ultimately, the jury didn't buy it. Well, it certainly doesn't make sense that she just fell down four steps and then kept trying to get up and kept falling and hitting almost exactly the same kind of area in her head. I mean, come on. Why wouldn't she try to roll over? Why wouldn't she try to crawl up on her hands? I'm not buying it. You know, I think that if we were the jury in this room, it would probably be three to one. I mean, I think I surprised some somebody by saying, I don't know if I was on that jury. Now, I'm saying that if I was on the jury that saw the evidence as presented in this documentary, yeah. I don't know that the documentary showed everything, but I would have wanted to see more to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed that murder. Now, do I think he did it? I think he did it. Was I convinced beyond a reasonable doubt from the presentation I saw in that documentary? I'm not sure. All right. Well, that's an important distinction from the presentation you saw in that documentary is not what the jury experienced. Right. The jury saw all the evidence and they convicted him beyond right. a reasonable doubt. That's yes. why I made that distinction. And I do want to say, Bobby, as I, I should tell our listeners that I actually yelled at Bobby yesterday when we were discussing this series, because when he said that, it drove me bananas because most people seem to believe that reasonable doubt just basically means you have to prove the case 100%. And that is not what beyond a reasonable doubt means. Reasonable doubt the definition of is a doubt for which you can find a reason. And Bobby, I'm just going to say right here as the judge, I don't think you have a good reason for your thinking. (laughs) Well, let me ask you guys, what are your thoughts on the children backing his play all the way to the end with the exception of the one daughter? Well, the one daughter that wasn't his daughter, daughter, but the sons were his sons. Mm -hmm. They're sticking with dad. I mean, she's just stepmom to them. Mm -hmm. They're not really concerned about her. They're concerned about their father. See, as far as the children goes, like, I would have liked this. I don't know that they testified. I I would think, I don't know. But I would have liked to see them, the prosecution called them and say, did you know that your father routinely sought out sexual relations outside his relationship and his marriage with your mother? Because he says that she was okay with it. Did you ever discuss it with it? Did she, did it seem like something that was out in the open and everybody knew, but just didn't talk about it? Was it out in the open with you? Because he's saying it was out in the open with you. And if they answered, yeah, yeah, we talked about it and stuff, then they could have been crossed on the fact that why did he say in things? We have to do this during the day because my wife can't find out. Right. I mean, right. So I'm, I'm a strong believer in the motive, right? If you could establish that strong motive, which I think I absolutely believe that that was his motive. I yes. think you're right, Jim. I think she said, hey, the gig's up. What, what the heck is all this on your computer? What's going on here? And he was, you know, frightened to death to have this all revealed, you know, could hurt his literary career. Who knows? And, uh, you know, so I think that was the motive. Um, and so if that was established by the prosecution, but the, certainly the documentary didn't show that. Right. But I think what they did show inadvertently, he didn't realize it, but as his lawyers were asking him questions about this, 
what did he say that when they first brought it up, he was like, well, what did the guy say? How much did he tell you? Right. He, he, he was only giving up as much as he. Well, no, he was lying. Right. And then he was only giving up as much as he thought they knew. Right. Yes. Which is what right. we all know. Everybody in this room knows that that's exactly what a liar does. They incrementally admit everything that they already know that, you know, right. and they don't admit anything more than that. Yes. One more reason, Bobby, that you can cite for believing that he is a murderer. So moving on, I think this is a great show to show the criminal justice system. I mean, you got unparalleled access, certainly in the beginning yes. of the prosecutors. You got crazy access to the defense team and to Peterson himself, who had hours and hours of screen time showing him smoke his pipe, dealing with his children, talking to his kids, hugging his kids. I mean, they did everything they could, these filmmakers, to make him look like a sympathetic, normal, loving human being. And, and they, they failed miserably <laughs> to an expert in behavior. They failed miserably because he showed his true colors. He's a narcissist. I mean, just smoke, the way he smoked that pipe, the way he interacted with people, the way he played the victim in all of this. Ugh. To me, it made me sick. Yeah, it was, it was so creep. bizarre when they would talk about things, you know, almost as if he wasn't there and discuss these topics and the look on his face and the cameraman would zoom in on him and his face was just one of... I'm not really here in this room while they're talking about all these crazy things. He just drove me crazy. And did no one think to trim his eyebrows? I mean, are we <laughs> Well, you remember, that up, actually, but... that was one of the funniest things that happened in the show is before yeah. the trial started, his defense attorney said, and make sure you trim those eyebrows. Yeah, well, actually, oh, I must have missed that. Yeah, yeah. He actually it, yeah. said that. So yeah, he was creepy looking, but he was creepy overall. And I think Jim, no. again, I hate saying this, Jim is so right about him being a narcissist. But this show also showed one of the worst things in the criminal justice system. And that is when occasionally you've got a bad apple. And when a bad apple spoils the bunch, and calls into question the entire justice system. Right. And that's what happened in the show. Yeah, I know. And when we come back in this new five episode iteration of The Staircase, we find out that a major, major part of this trial could have been based on fraud. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I said that earlier, I think in the last episode that like I was not impressed with Deaver's presentation, his, his physical presentation. He was the blood spatter expert that blood, testified at the trial. The SBI you know, agent that gave you all of the modeling and all that stuff on what happened and his little um, experiments that were videotaped and shown to the jury. I didn't think those were very professional. They were bad. very small town, yeah. you know, thrown together demonstrations. They weren't really scientific. And they were one of the things that if I was a juror, I would have looked at like, I don't believe that because it just seemed too cheesy. Yeah. Just seemed too and what happened? Done. He, he took a blow poke and he started hitting this piece of wood or with a sponge on on top of it and it broke yeah. it broke it the first hit. and it wasn't he was yeah. barely even hitting the thing he yeah. was barely raising it and, and it i think that that, I, yeah i think to, to me i think the prosecution may have actually i think some of the jurors may have even said afterwards that, that his presentation was one of the things that carried the day with them to me it actually would have turned me off to the prosecution's case Well, and so what happened was Deaver's conduct in an earlier case came to light in another famous murder case. And in about 2011, after Michael Peterson had been in prison about eight years, another man who was a convicted murderer was released because Deaver had testified similarly to Peterson's case in this other man's trial. And it was discovered that he had no qualifications to do it. He had lied about his previous experience and he had put on the similar experiments that were really just demonstrations. And so this other convicted murderer was released and Michael Peterson's defense team finds out about it. Yeah, I mean, and I would be pounced. jumping for joy, right? So they did pass and they got him out. They got his conviction vacated, and that means he was released from prison. He was released from prison. And this brings up to me the section of this show that actually bothered me the most when I was looking at you know government misconduct. Obviously, the Deaver stuff was very disturbing, and it was the right result. I think you had to overturn his conviction. There's no doubt about it because of Deaver. However, then we have a delay of about five years when he gets out of prison and before he actually goes any, into any kind of hearing on the case. The prosecutor doesn't schedule a new trial. They just wait and wait and delay and delay. And there's about a five year delay total. And I was very distressed by that. If you are the prosecutor's office, someone has gotten out of prison because of misconduct in the government, you do one of two things. You tell them that you're dropping all the charges, which they did tell the defense from the beginning. We're not doing fine. So you didn't do that. So then the second thing you do is you set the case for trial. Evidence doesn't get better with age. People's mm. memories don't get better with age. And yet they just just let it sit. It was like three years, I think. And then before the new set of pretrial motions started up. Yeah. Right? But then there, there was another two. Motions. Yes. So right. it was a total of five years that he waited for any kind of final resolution to these charges that were still pending. And I have no sympathy for Peterson, but from a criminal justice standpoint, that really bothered me. And I think it was wrong on the part of the government. Yeah. I mean, I think you should add, though, that it was a new district attorney. It wasn't the same district attorney. So it's a new person who didn't really have as much in the game. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that I think they knew that it was going to be very difficult to convict him, given the fact that one, this blood spatter expert had lied and, and totally discredited that. And two, there, there were things that changed sort of in the zeitgeist around the trial. And I think that they were, at least the judge said, he was reconsidering whether or not he would let in the evidence about the death 
of the good friend female in Germany. That's right. He did. The judge did say that he didn't think he was going to let in that prior bad act with the death of Elizabeth Ratliff, in spite of the fact that his now chief medical examiner was the one who did the autopsy on both women and found that they were both victims of homicide. The judge said he didn't think he would have let that in, nor would he have let in the computer images of the gay pornography that were so significant to the jury, I think, like Bobby said earlier, in creating motive. Yeah, yeah. I think in, if I was a juror and that evidence was held out, if there wasn't the evidence of the blood spatter expert that was in the first trial, and if there wasn't the motive evidence, really, that the, you know, that the gay pornography on the computer kind of led to, it would have even been a tougher time for the prosecution to get a conviction. Yeah, and I think the reason why that should have come in is because it does go directly to motive. And so I don't know why they would hold that out. The other thing is, I mean, prior bad acts are prior bad acts. Whether they're too prejudicial, I think that's something that should be discussed in the judge's instructions to the jury. Yeah, well, I completely disagree with the judge, and he's wrong. There's all kinds of legal precedent that permits the admission of prior bad acts so long as they're similar. And I don't think you can argue in this case yeah. that those two things are oh, not similar. So similar. They I mean, were so similar. So similar to both of these incidents were so similar. You'd almost be, you know, you're not serving justice if you don't tell the jury. That's about. right. Well, that's exactly right. And like Jim said, the evidence of the affairs or the whatever he called it, uh, these liaisons with other men certainly could have provided motive. And the prosecution is always entitled to prove motive. And I think what's really interesting about this show that we never see is you have all this going on in the background, right? So the defense is deciding whether they want to retry it. The prosecution's deciding whether they could retry it. And at the same time in the show, they're having discussions about whether or not he's going to enter a guilty plea. Right. And then they raise the entire issue of an Alfred plea. And I think, Francie, this is a perfect opportunity for you to explain what exactly is an Alfred plea and why is it called Alfred? <laughs> it's Alfred. And How it's do you spell that? A-L-F-O-R-D. Alfred. Alfred. It's Alfred versus North Carolina was a big Supreme Court decision that said that the accused has the absolute right to plead guilty without admitting actual guilt. That is, in particular, if it's in their best interest. It's really also called a best interest plea. So the person can say, under Alford versus North Carolina, I am pleading guilty not because I am guilty, but because I believe the state can prove my guilt. Right. But in this particular case, they did make him say that he was guilty. That's because an Alford plea is technically a guilty plea. And so what they made him say was, I'm guilty pursuant to Alford versus North Carolina. And that pursuant to Alford versus North Carolina specifically means I'm pleading guilty because I admit the state could convict me, but I'm not actually admitting I did it. So in this case, there's a big back and forth. At first, he says he will never take an Alford plea. He's going to fight this. He's going to fight this. And then he reconsiders, doesn't he? Well, he does reconsider. And I mean, I want to know what your take on that is to me. You know, of course, I've, I, everyone knows that listens to this show that I'm very black and white when it comes to justice. And so to me, if you plead guilty, it's because you are guilty, period. But what do you guys think about his discussions about just making the case finally go away and uh, having it having closure as they talk well, about? Well, I think that it's fascinating those last five when we move forward in time, eight, really 10 years, and you see his aging and you see the children who are basically teenagers, 19 and 20 at the time, his two daughters that sat behind him every day of the trial. And now you see them 10 years later and they have children. He has grandchildren. So I think it's, it was a fascinating look at change over time and what these things do to each other. So I think the decision-making process is different. You're, you have different considerations, different things are important to you in your life and things like that. So I think watching him make those decisions later on was just a fascinating study in, in aging and in time and in family dynamics, because there were certain people you saw in the beginning, those first eight episodes that you didn't even see, certain family members that, and there was no explanation on why they were no longer there. Right. Um, and so, you know, but you saw other family members come in that you didn't see in the beginning. And then the ones that you did see from the beginning to the end had aged and they, they had moved away and, you know, they had moved to one moved to the West Coast. And so I think it was a very interesting. That's kind of what interested me more was the family dynamic changing and how that impacted the, the overall decision making. And I thought it had to do with two things. One, finances. They talked a lot during the initial episodes about this costing $750,000 or even more. And when you consider the amount of evidence that they had, he now knows all the evidence that they have, even without uh, the testimony of um, Devers. He knows they can convict him and he knows how salacious the information is and how bad it's going to look. So you just, you're weighing all those things. And it made perfect sense because at this point, he's probably going to get a lot less time and he'll get out sooner, and he's not going to blow all the money that they made on the life insurance. Which he didn't have anymore. Apparently, he didn't have any money, so that's why his attorney had to actually be court-appointed. But I think when we look at the facts, as he's trying to weigh whether or not to take this Alford plea, that he basically knows that the prosecution can no longer put in this blood expert, that there's not going to be anything about the gay porn or the his sexual relationships with men outside of this marriage, and there's not going to be anything about the Germany victim. What would make you think that you could get convicted? without those three major pieces of evidence. Why would you not, if you were innocent, why would you not fight that? Even with the public defense attorney, why not? Why would you still get in front of that judge and say, yes, I am criminally responsible for her death. I plead guilty, even though they're out. I mean, I'll play devil, devil's advocate here for, for a minute. I think that, you know, he was what, 70 something years old? I think he was 70. 70 years old. He had already spent eight years in prison. He knew he didn't want to go back. 
And we both, we know that it's just a roll of dice. I mean, yes, he probably would not have been convicted. But at that point, when he's told, look, all you have to stand up in court and say these couple of words, does it, it's not going to impact the rest of your life. You're not going to go back to jail. They're not going to send you to jail on the Alfred plea. So I think I understand that calculation that he made based on where he was in his life and what his experience had just been. If I was his lawyer, or even if I was in his place, I'd say, why should I roll the dice? I, I can guarantee myself the rest of my life outside of this miserable jail that I've already spent eight years in, if I just stand up in court and say this, so I'm a convicted felon. I'm 70 years old. I'm not going to be going for a job that, that's going to kick me out because I'm a convicted felon. Yeah, but so many people, so many people actually do fight. And the fact is, this shows the disparity between somebody who has money, whether he earned it or his wife earned it, and somebody who doesn't. Because every single day, there are people in this country who have no money, who don't have lavish defense attorneys and lavish presentations at trials, and they have to deal with just somebody that's appointed to them who probably has a hundred other cases and doesn't really give them much respect or, or any kind of actual defense. And they go to trial. They go to trial because they're innocent and they want to prove that. Well, and let me just say, Jim, because I think I've already agreed with you way too much in this podcast. So now I have to take a contrary position. I just want to stand up a little bit for public defenders, which is going to sound weird to our listeners that I'm standing up for public defenders. But some of the best lawyers I ever prosecuted cases against were the public defenders, both at the state level and the federal defenders yep. at the federal level. And I always like to say that if I got into trouble, if I got into criminal trouble, it would be a federal or a state public defender that I would want to hire because they know the system, they know the prosecutors, they know the judges. And oftentimes they have far more experience than anyone else does who's out there getting paid to try, you know, one Wait. More experience. And so while Jim's right, I think that money does buy you a certain level of defense. I don't think that lack of money necessarily means you're just going to get rolled and be convicted. I don't know well, if that's I what didn't we were saying. say that at all. But what I what I will say is that public defender, if they had the money to hire five expert witnesses and somebody to make videos and live presentations and rebuild crime scenes, they're in a better position. Yeah, and agreed. most of the time they don't have the money to do that. The defendant has nothing and the defense attorney is stuck with whatever he has available to him. And that's unfortunate because justice should be equal. And I think this show actually points out to a great degree how unequal justice can well, be at well, times. But, but he was a rich white guy from a rich white neighborhood with a rich white wife. She wound up dead. He had all the money in the world for his defense team. He had an all-star defense team and he still got convicted. I know that. But he says he was innocent and then he pled guilty. What I'm talking about is the fact that he didn't want to fight it again. The fact that he did actually say, OK, I will plead guilty for murdering, not for accidentally killing or criminally negligent homicide, for murdering my wife. But Jim, I would maybe never he lost, say that. Maybe he lost his fight. His hips were bad. His back was bad. He could barely walk. He's an old man. He's got grandchildren. All these things have gone under the bridge. He still managed to smile for the camera. I think that's the most important thing to him was the limelight. And it just put him in the limelight one more time. I mean, I think this highlights the, the, why we shouldn't have Alfred, please. Why Alfred is a bad law. I mean, we shouldn't allow people to stand up there and plead guilty and say, but I didn't do it. I mean, that's not what our system of justice is. You should only be convicted and punished if you're guilty of the crime. I agree. You should not be allowed to say, I'm guilty, but I didn't do it. It's it's antithetical to our, our, our justice system. Agreed. I completely agree. And I who think- the justices on the Supreme Court who <laughs> made that decision? <laughs> I don't think any of the ones on there now were, were, in that, were involved in that decision. But so we should tell our listeners that what happened next was after all that decision making, he did enter a, an Alford plea. He said he was pleading guilty pursuant to Alford versus North Carolina. And let's talk for just a moment about- Kathleen's sister. The only person that seemed to really give a damn about Kathleen Peterson in all of this was her sister. Yeah. Well, both sisters. But and then, and one of her daughters. Yes, but we never heard from her though. Right. But the one sister in particular fought for her, told the prosecutors that she would not agree to letting them drop the charges that she wanted him pursued. I have a feeling that woman would have hounded him to the gates of hell itself. She And I admire that and I would do the same I if someone same hurt my thing. sister. Absolutely, 100%. <clears throat> so I think that her statement, her fiery and impassioned statement to the judge, I don't know if it impacted the judge. His sentence you know, wasn't great after the plea, but that impacted me. Right, and I think that that Maureen, in answer to you, did he just lose his fight? Well, here's somebody else who was very invested in this same fight, and she didn't lose her fight. And I believe that if I was in that situation and I was previously convicted of a murder I didn't commit, and then they said they're going to take out all these major pieces of evidence and things have changed over time, I would absolutely have been enthusiastic about fighting it again. But what you're saying brings up a great point, is that he's weighing the fact that they can probably convict him again. And that is, to me, brings up the single most frustrating, maddening, and shocking things about this entire series. And that is what the filmmakers left out of this docuseries. And we only learned about it because the prosecutor in one of those late hearings after he was released from prison was arguing about why the judge shouldn't overturn the conviction. The prosecutor said that the cause of death was strangulation. We never heard that. We never heard the medical examiner say it, although I know she did when she testified in the trial. The filmmakers cut that out. They did not give us, the viewers, the benefit of knowing the one single piece of evidence that made it almost impossible for this to have been any kind of a fall accidentally down the stairs. Absolutely. And on top of that, you know, people are saying something about some owl that could have done it, which is completely asinine. <laughs> and anybody who has that theory, I would love to debate you, please. <laughs> but that is ridiculous because 
as far as I know, an owl is incapable of strangling a human being to death. As far as I know, maybe this is a different owl that has extra arms. You need thumbs. Yeah, yeah, something like that. But what this tells us is that, A, the defense's defense was a lie, a knowing lie, and that the prosecution, with the, the blowpoke thing, I mean, what, what is your problem? Why did they even care about the blowpoke? Why didn't they say, all right, your defense experts believe that she fell and hit her head on the stairs a couple of times. That's great. Fine. Maybe that did happen, but somebody finished her off. And there's only one person who was in there. There's no evidence anybody walked in there from the outside, broke their way in, did anything like that. There's absolutely no evidence of another human being being in that house during that time. So there's only one person who could have been there. That's it. Why didn't they leave it at that? Instead, they went on this. Overplayed. Yes. And now that you say that, strangulation plays in perfectly to all the lacerations on the back of her head. Bang, bang, bang. 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 And for those listeners who can't see Maureen, <laughs> she's got her hands as if they're wrapped around a victim's head and she's banging it forward on the ground. Sounds like somebody who had a fight, perhaps. Maybe uh, they had an argument, for example, maybe over the fact that he had infidelity issues and with men on top of that. So there's all sorts of reasons why the physical evidence just has no relationship at all to not only the prosecution's theory, but the defense's theory. Why were they doing that? I just don't know. Well, and I think for me, what's significant, Jim, that I found out through researching uh, before we did this podcast is that not only did the filmmakers fail to tell us this singular, most important piece of evidence that is the cause of death of Kathleen Peterson, but the possible reason that they p spent so much time with the defendant and trying to make him look sympathetic and leaving out cause of death to make it look like it could have been a fall. And that is specifically the editor of this docuseries was sleeping with Michael Peterson during the filming. Well, yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. That wasn't revealed. And the filmmaker <clears throat> didn't tell us that. And I think that is so dishonest because it explains why we saw the female prosecutor only at times when she was calling pornography filth in a Southern accent as if somehow she's some sort of, you know, rube from the South who was unintelligent. We saw very little from the prosecution team. And it was all focused on Michael Peterson, his family, his kids, how much they loved him, how much they supported him. And then the defense experts, even the ones who didn't testify. So the jury never saw Lee and Spitz. But we, the viewer, got to hear their pet theories and never the real cause of death. Yeah, I think she was flying three or four times a year from France to the U.S. to visit him in prison while he was in prison. And certainly their physical relationship renewed once he was out of prison. I think it only ended last year um, because he refused to move to France full time. Mm. Well, that's certainly another amazing revelation, something that was held from the viewers, something that they didn't know. And it was clearly manipulative. It was made to make him look innocent in a situation where those two facts alone I don't know. They condemn the man in my eyes. Well, I mean, you look at the difference, too. I mean, those early episodes where there was defense meetings at his house, they were like dinner parties. They were, I would almost say they were lavish. They were all laughing and drinking wine. All the while, four feet away was the bloody staircase right. still. You know, they were they were all laughing. And I understand that those things are very long processes and very long days. And there's, you know, break. But they seem to be, you know, these dinner parties. And they were all having a good time and laughing and joking. You contrast that to years later. All the money's gone. All the parties are gone. All the wine's gone. And he's living out of a little hovel, driving himself in a small car to the courthouse and getting out. And the cameras are gone right. and stuff. And I think that that contrast years later was really fascinating. Right. So this was a fascinating series to me for many reasons. I love the inside look at the criminal justice system uh, and how it works. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And for me, there was really never any doubt from the first moment I heard the 911 call. I believed he was guilty. I still believe that he is guilty. I think that he should have had to plead without pleading under Alford. But there's no doubt in my mind that Michael Peterson has killed two women, has gotten away with one. And eight years in prison, to me, means he's gotten away with two. Well, Francie, uh, I have to admit that I <clears throat> Keep going. Agree with you. Uh, <laughs> you see the pained look on Jim's yeah. face. To the viewers. <laughs> because I too believe that Michael Peterson should have been rightfully convicted the first time and had those unfortunate events not happened. In fact, if Deaver had not gone off the deep end and made some outrageous claims and lied about his qualifications, I think that conviction would have stood. It should have stood. I do believe that his behavior screams out that he was not an innocent person, that he did in fact kill his wife and tried to stage it to look like it was an accident. I think he did it because she had found out what his true sexuality was and he had been cheating on her repeatedly. And I don't know how she would have taken that in stride and not been upset about it. I think that would have created a major problem in their marriage. And I think that he killed her as a result of that. It may not have been premeditated. It may have happened in the heat of the moment, but I do believe he killed her. I believe that I agree with Dr. Lee that she could have fallen in those stairs, but I think she couldn't have sustained all those injuries without him helping her by yanking her down once or more times. And I do believe that there's absolutely no way that she could have been strangled to death without him strangling her. Mm -hmm. That's my thoughts. Bobby, what do you think? Um, I think he did it. I think he killed her. I think he probably killed a woman in Germany. However, one of the takeaways that I took from this series is that 
you know, the, we as the viewer do not get the same information that the jurors get. And I would have, I can't say whether I would have voted to convict or acquit, you know, um, without having sat in the jury box and know what they, because now we know that these filmmakers were so selective in what they told us and how they showed us what they told us. There's no way that I can form an opinion based on what I saw in the show. It's just too slanted. Do I think he did it based on just the amount of blood? Do I think she fell down that stairs and that's how she got those injuries? No. Is there anyone else that conceivably could have done it? No. So the conclusion is, in my opinion, is that he did it. Now, I won't say that I would have voted to convict until I sit in that chair and you see all the government evidence the way it's presented in, because I just don't think we got an accurate picture of that in this particular show. And I just want to announce that I'm going to cut that last part of Bobby's statement to pretend <laughs> that he didn't say it. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Bobby's entitled to his opinion even when he's wrong. So, Maureen. I felt he was guilty. Um, I knew it was going that way from one of the opening scenes when he was first walking around. And as I said, he was being very robotic. I, of course, kept an open mind throughout the entire uh, series. But I do believe, as Bobby said, that when we watch these documentaries, we have to understand the source. And the source always wants to lure you in, to hook you. And it hooked me. I, I admit it. It hooked me. However, I always know that there has to be more information out there. I'm a person when I'm learning about a case, whether I'm trying to work on a cold case or something, I like to read the court testimony because you get everything then. And I like to ingest all the information. So yes, I think he was guilty. I think he was guilty of both murders. Wow. Well, I think that we've had an amazing discussion these last two episodes of Netflix's docuseries, The Staircase. I just want to say thank you to both Maureen and to Bobby, who are very favored guests here on Best Case, Worst Case, Absolutely. for joining us on this worst case scenario and for Jim Clemente and all of us. This is Francie Hakes. Thank you so much for listening to this special episode of Best Case, Worst Case, Worst Case Scenario, The Staircase. Until next time. Best Case, Worst Case is an XG production. Produced by Jim Clemente at Empire Studios, LA. Engineered and edited by Mike Thal. Music composed and performed by Simba Tsumba. And hosted by Wonder. You can listen to Best Case, Worst Case on your favorite listening app. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to do something about child sexual abuse, Darkness Delight can help. Did you know that more than 90% of the time children are sexually abused by someone they know? Jim, this isn't about stranger danger. It's about learning the true risks. Darkness to Light's training can help prevent, recognize, and react to child sexual abuse in your community. When you make the decision to get involved, kids can be protected. It starts with you. Visit www.d2l.org to take the training and learn more. That's d2l.org.